So um, Teresa introduced really nicely some of the concepts of electrical stimulation um, that we use to try to enhance function not after stroke, in our case after spinal cord injury. And so what I want to walk you through today is our concepts of how we might use this idea of engineered neuroplasticity, how we could use devices, whether they're electrical or optical, to influence the connectivity within the brain or within the spinal cord. And so, a little bit cut off there, but if we, um, if we imagine that uh, we have electrodes at multiple sites in the brain or the spinal cord, we might be able to pair the activity um, of um, natural activity and stimulation in order to actually change synaptic strength. And we think this is what happens naturally during rehabilitation. The question is, can we enhance that if we pair rehabilitation with electrical spinal stimulation? In the first example I'll show you, with optogenetic spinal stimulation in the next example, and in the final example, um, our entree into early human studies uh, where we're stimulating the spinal cord electrically but non-invasively, so transcutaneous spinal stimulation. And just to turn that into pictures for you, um, what we do here, I might just reboot the, um, the slide so we get, don't, aren't cut off the entire time. Um, we will um, show you the comparison of the invasive versus the non-invasive. Um, so we'll begin by talking about intraspinal microstimulation. This is actually inserting tiny hair-like wires within the spinal cord parenchyma to put electrical charge near the motor neurons or near the inner neurons. We'll talk about some of our early successes there, including some attempts to influence um, the fate of stem cells, actually, that were also transplanted um, below the injury in the spinal cord. Then we'll move to um, optogenetic stimulation, which is in the same location as you might know of epidural stimulation, so laying on the surface of the spinal cord outside the dura, and how we can optically stimulate um, in animal models who've been virally transfected to express opsins. And then we'll move to our human study where we talk about transcutaneous stimulation. Here we've shown a drawing without the skin intact, just so you can see the bony landmarks that we use over the cervical spinal cord for people with incomplete cervical spinal cord injuries, um, but in, case, in fact, this is actually applied just through the skin. So our first study actually used the same outcome measure that Teresa nicely introduced, this precision forelimb reaching task, uh, developed for stroke, but it turns out to be very handy for cervical spinal cord injury as well. So we trained animals to perform this task before they received a lateralized C4 contusion injury, so an injury of the fourth cervical segment. That dramatically impairs their ability to perform this task as it interrupts the connections between the cortex uh, and the cervical spinal cord. And we implanted wires here below the injury um, and delivered therapeutic stimulation, open loop stimulation, um, for most of a day, uh, five days a week for about 12 weeks. So it was a very prolonged treatment and we began four weeks after treatment in order to model at least the semi-chronic uh, spinal cord condition. And what we found was compared to animals that were not stimulated, so still implanted with wires but not stimulated, um, these animals actually exhibit severe tone and spasticity as is common in spinal cord injury, unable to reach through the plexiglass wall to grasp this food pellet. Animals that were stimulated for 12 weeks, even though the stimulation is not applied during the videos, are able to easily reach out and grasp the food pellet. So less tone, less spasticity, more able to extend that forelimb and reach for the food. The videos, of course, show a clear difference, and there was a clear difference in um, the data, although as we talked about yesterday, these are highly variable uh, outcome measures, um, nowhere near full recovery. Uh, unstimulated animals barely recover at all in this task. It's a very severe injury. Stimulated animals uh, recover better, but certainly not completely. Um, so we're still looking for better ways to do that, and we'll talk about optogenetics um, next. One of the things we did notice in some of our animals that discontinued stimulation early just due to technical failures uh, in their electrodes uh, actually sustained a good amount of that recovery for many weeks after the study ended. And that was important to us because this long-term plasticity, this long-term recovery is one of our goals uh, with these treatments. Not just a prosthetic that enhances function while it's running, but rather a device that can help to heal or restore function to the damaged nervous system. Um, this just shows the difference in spasticity and tone. Unstimulated animals have this flexor contracture. It's common after injury. Stimulated animals uh, don't have that, which is nice to see. 
We took a little bit of a side trip with our collaborator, Phil Horner, when he was here, he's now at Houston Methodist, um, to see whether intraspinal microstimulation could affect the fate or survival of transplanted um, iPSCs or induced pluripotent stem cells. So these are human iPSCs transplanted into the spinal cord, and we delivered that same type of therapeutic uh, stimulation because in pilot experiments, we'd seen that cells seem to survive better and that their fate um, was more differentiated um, towards neurons as opposed to astrocytes, which is kind of the default here. Um, unfortunately, that didn't hold up in a larger study. Um, we're still very interested in exploring this, but it's just one example of seeing some tantalizing preliminary evidence that didn't pan out um, in the long-term study. Uh, but we do have a long-term interest in trying to use either electrical or optical stimulation in order to influence grafted uh, stem cells. I think that's really where regenerative rehabilitation and, and some of these neural devices can come together. Um, our next um, little story that we're going to tell today is about optical stimulation. So we've been trying to get less invasive, but also more cell type specific with our stimulation. So can we shine light from the surface of the cord onto neurons that are either um, in transgenic animals, such as this first study here in the mouse, this is a thigh one mouse, or in the next study I'll show you in non-transgenic rats, but have been virally transduced uh, to express opsins. This is work with Pauline Anakiva at MIT, where she develops these very flexible, thin waveguides pictured here. You can wrap them around your pinky, thread them into the difficult to reach uh, spinal cord areas and still deliver light um, at depth. Uh, Sarah Mandela, who is I think here today, she's a, a new research faculty in our department. She's been developing a chronic method to deliver this light therapy um, for animals after injury. Um, in this case, she's using a micro LED just sitting on the surface uh, of the spinal cord. Um, when those animals are virally transduced and the light is uh, flashed, as indicated by the LED, little LED flashing here, you'll sometimes see um, a nice uh, reciprocal movement there, uh, just showing that we can induce movement. It's not necessarily our goal with the treatment, but we know we're in the motor pools, we're um, inducing movement of these animals. Our goal is really to use it as a therapy, right? To see whether light stimulation enhances recovery. And still preliminary data, but in Sarah's case, she's seeing very dramatic recovery, a full 10 to 17 point increase in each day that she stimulates uh, with light. And that's certainly the fastest recovery we've ever seen. Of course, you can overdo it if you continue to stimulate. Sometimes the animals get worse, but Sarah's developed a very nice um, pattern where she stimulates for a long time in the first few weeks and then titrates that over time. And she's able to get these animals to continue to increase and here uh, nearly back to pre-injury uh, reaching levels in, in very few weeks of stimulation. So this is really exciting for us. Uh, it also doesn't seem to matter when she begins the stimulation. Teresa pointed out timing was critical. In these studies, whether we begin at four weeks, six weeks, or uh, 10 weeks, I think, was the last animal here. We see this dramatic increase right uh, in the first few days that the light is turned on. Um, so we think we're on to something here. Obviously, need more, uh, more work to validate this, um, but it's exciting to see this type of recovery. Some of these animals, of course, persisting. Benefits are persisting again after uh, the stimulation is shown by the open circles there. All right, the final... Um, portion of the talk, I want to talk about our human translation. And as I think things often are in science, it's somewhat nonlinear, right? We're not translating optogenetics to humans just yet. We're not even translating intraspinal stimulation, although people are working on that. Um, what we're able to translate is non-invasive stimulation, but I think using the same principles of constantly electrically exciting the circuits in the spinal cord and pairing that with rehabilitation. So we use a high carrier frequency uh, waveform. Uh, this is a collaboration with Reggie Edgerton and others at UCLA, um, where we deliver standard one millisecond pulses every thir or 30 times per second, but within that pulse, uh, we oscillate at 10 kilohertz. And what this does is effectively anesthetize the skin so that we can pass high amounts of current, in our case, 80 milliamps or more, through the skin to excite the spinal cord non-invasively. I'll tell you about two participants so far in our study. The first gentleman was 62 years old. He had a C3 or high cervical uh, incomplete central cord injury. So he was Asia D, which means some level of sensory, some level of motor function. And he was two years after injury when we began to work with him. We started um, by stimulating the spinal cord um, for about an hour a day in combination with intensive physical and occupational therapy, or PT for short. This was a matter of convenience because it was when we were able to borrow the initial prototype stimulator. We then crossed over and did physical therapy only. And you'll see in our second subject, we've reversed the order. So it's a randomized crossover design. 
um, worked with him four to five days a week for an hour a day. What we noticed was very dramatic improvement in hand function. Nearly every single motor function test that we gave him improved. So compared to a stable baseline here for the first three or four weeks, he nearly doubled his strength if we're looking at manual muscle testing of 10 muscles on each side. Um, during the period of stimulation, physical therapy had a slight additional benefit. We stimulated again for another five days here just to see if we could give additional boost, and indeed he did improve, especially while the stimulator was running. So orange dots, the stimulator's on, blue dots, the stimulator is off. And then the most exciting part of this figure for me is the fact that he sustained all those improvements for over three months after the end of all therapy and all stimulation. This is work led by a fantastic graduate student in the lab, Fatma Nanichi. She's here at the conference today. So she's Sam Jima is a physical therapist and also PhD student. So we were talking yesterday about the future of PTs in this field, and I think it's very promising. And our neurosurgery collaborator, Christoph Hofstetter. Uh, let me show you a couple of videos to kind of drive home the point of how this stimulation works. So this first uh, video is, is before we began stimulation. So it's a second baseline visit. The stimulator is, of course, off. And the task is to grasp the water bottle and pour the liquid into the jar. You can see the participants unable to grasp uh, the water bottle. This is after four weeks of stimulation, and the stimulation is still running at this point. And now you can see he can much better manipulate his fingers to get a hold of the jar, position it in place. And it was during one of the follow-up visits um, where we actually took, were confident enough to take the lid off the jar. And you can see there he can complete the task quite easily. So it wasn't just things like pouring water that improved. It was actually almost every single motor function measure in the GRASP test. This is a standardized test for upper extremity function for people with spinal cord injury. So pouring water, uh, moving pegs, as you'll see in a moment, putting keys in locks, coins in slots, nuts on and off of bolts. Um, and again, that same pattern of dramatic improvement during stimulation, perhaps either an after effect or a subtle benefit of PT, and then that sustained recovery uh, for many months afterwards. Here's a video of the peg test. Uh, again, baseline's shown first. He's not able to bring his fingers and thumb together to grasp even a single peg. Uh, the two that fell out there got caught between his fourth and his fifth digits. Um, but you can see here this movement, but no functional uh, pinch grip. And this is with the stimulator off. So after four weeks of treatment, even without stimulation, he's able to bring his finger and thumb together. It's a subtle difference, but a very functional difference and complete uh, moving each of these pegs. And we fast forward there because it takes about a minute and 15 seconds to complete the test for him. Uh, but he does complete every single move without any mistakes. The next day, if we turn the stimulator on to test, he can do it about twice as fast. So there's still a benefit to the stimulation. We think it's still turning up the gain in the spinal circuitry, but it's no longer necessary to complete the tasks. As we mentioned, this functional pinch force was one of his um, one of his nice improvements, and that's really shown here when we ask him to do a tip-to-tip -tip pinch um, or a key pinch on a, on a force meter, especially his weak right hand. Um, he could produce only about six newtons at the beginning of the study, and he actually has almost a seven or eight-fold improvement in grip strength when the stimulator's running and about a four-fold improvement when the stimulator's off, and that improvement sustained for the follow-up, about a doubling in his left hand, which was stronger uh, when he began the study. So we've gone on to look at another participant. This participant has motor complete paralysis from the wrist down. He's Asia B. That means he has a little bit of sensory function, but no motor function. Um, he's C5 when he started the study. Um, in this case, we're, we're switched to a digital uh, force meter here, but that same tip to tip pinch that I just mentioned. And you can see he's motor paralyzed for four weeks of baseline in both hands and for four weeks of physical therapy only. He's not able to produce any movement or any force between his fingertips. And it's only after two to three weeks of stimulation, and first with the stimulation running, especially in the left hand, and later even with the stimulation not running, he regains this ability to move his fingers and to produce very small, it's only about four newtons um, of force, but measurable force. And you can see that stimulation seems to cause that force to increase. PT alone causes it to perhaps hold steady or oscillate. And again, that maintenance during follow-up. And I believe we just got his final um, follow-up in here. And he's maintained this ability as well. So these kind of things can be life-changing in terms of quality of life. He's learning to drive a car now. Um, he's working on self-catheterization, which is a way to ma man manage his bladder. Um, and so these, even these very small forces can have uh, big functional changes.
All right, let's go back to our first subject. Again, just to emphasize the changes in quality of life. Um, this gentleman, one of his goals was to regain self-feeding, which is something he hadn't done since his injury. So Fatma created this unique task where he's scooping paper clips to simulate feeding. And you could see at day zero, he might have been able to feed himself something that wasn't a liquid. Um, and this is the immediate benefit of stimulation. So just turning the stimulator on, he's smoother and more controlled, but still quite slow. But after three weeks of stimulation, again, with the stimulator running in this case, he's much faster and much smoother. And these are qualitative results, of course. But he's, at this point, feeding himself at home. He continues to do that today. And that's his son in the background, who's his primary caregiver. And so at least his son has one less thing to help his dad with in terms of doing the daily feeding. So our first participant, his name was Joe. He doesn't mind if I share that with you. He was so excited about the improvements in his hands that he actually lobbied us um, for over a year to try the same type of stimulation for walking for lower extremity function. Um, and we had some evidence from UCLA that people who are paraplegic or injured in the mid thoracic spinal cord improve walking with this same pattern of stimulation. And so we designed a study to stimulate again around his injury, but also to stimulate lumbosacral uh, enlargements. And this shows actually sort of um, sacral um, markings, but of course on the bony landmarks, that's much higher. And so we began by having him stand and practice his active balance in a body weight supported treadmill system, move to walking in that treadmill system, and then eventually over ground. And I actually don't have the final picture here, but he's now walking with just a single four point cane. Uh, does have a forearm support because his hands are still weak. So it's difficult for him to grasp. That's why he's using a modified front wheeled walker here where he can have his forearms attached. Uh, but really remote, notice dramatic improvements in his walking. Not all of them attributed to stimulation. There is some improvement during therapy only, um, but the two combined, um, seemed, he seems to improve quite dramatically over the, this was a four month um, study. So I wanna wrap up there and leave some time for questions. Um, what have we talked about today? We started with our animal studies where we talked about therapeutic intraspinal uh, microstimulation. We saw that that enhanced recovery in our animals, although to a modest and variable amount. Um, we're very curious to know whether things like electrical stimulation can improve the grafting and survival and maybe the interconnections um, between stem cells, especially in the spinal cord, but perhaps also in other parts of the nervous system. And we talked about optogenetic stimulation. We're seeing a much more robust and rapid recovery when we optically stimulate virally transduced interneurons in the spinal cord. Um, the question is, can we translate this to human subjects? There are certainly two trials going on for blindness in the eye, where opsins are injected into the eye for people with retinitis pigmentosa. So some of that is beginning to translate. And then we talked about a non-invasive method for uh, delivering spinal stimulation to people with high cervical injury. And we saw both rapid as well as persistent recovery of hand function and some hints for walking as well. So now we're working on how we can optimize these types of non-invasive treatments and how we can combine them most precisely uh, with things like physical therapy. So I didn't mention on the way through, but if you just stimulate someone while they sit Quietly, there's no recovery. So the combination of stimulation and rehabilitation is what seems um, to lead to the recovery. So I'll thank all the people that did the work here, um, both collaborators, students, and postdocs in the lab, and of course the funding agencies that have supported us along the way. Thank you guys for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.